Bear with me one second. So for everyone out there, we're talking about Packet Trap PSA, Professional Services Automation. And just a couple slides to get you in tune with where we are, where we're going, um, and really our overarching goals or principles. So as you look at what's in front of us here, hopefully you're seeing a slide that has intuitive, convenient, and immediate. These are our guiding principles in development. And to go back to when we launched the product back in two th early 2000s, um, it was kind of three strikes or three strikes and then success, actually. We had pushed out the tool once and we learned that it just was hard to implement, it wasn't intuitive, and the end users really just stopped using it. And so we kind of pulled it back and we retooled it a little bit and you know, some of the owners of the, uh, the users that wanted some more data and we retooled it for the data that they needed and pushed it back out and that was our second strike. We again learned that what's going on and people aren't using the tool and it's not getting the, the lift that we want and so we, we brought it back in and we took a look and we uh, got a bunch of folks together and said hey well, what's the problem and we learned a really important lesson there and the, the tool was like a lot of the other software. We'd wrap it up in a box, we'd stick a disk in a in the box and send it to you, and you had to install it, and it was a pain, and you had to push it out to your users, and that was hard. And um, then once the end users, the folks in the field, had access to the tool, it was even more difficult. And so after our little consortium there, we decided, hey, let's do some things t to keep us on track here. The, the tool's got to be intuitive, meaning you know, let's almost make it an enjoyable experience for the people in the field. Because if we get the information from the folks in the field, then we should be able to get that data over to the right people and the powers that be to be able to dissect and really guide the business. And it's got to be convenient. You know, the days of wrapping up software and sticking it in a box and sending it out and hoping that somebody installs it and actually uses it, that's not a very convenient. And so we leveraged the SaaS model, a software as a service, where if you can hit a website, you can hit our tool, and it's very convenient. We've done that both on the mobile side as well as just the regular uh, application side. And last but not least, it's gotta be immediate. So what does immediate mean? Again, one example is that shrink wrap software that I send it to you, you gotta pull it out and stick it in the disk tray and, and figure it out from there. Um, so immediate would be you log in and you build your business, as well as you're out in the field. It's gotta be immediate. It's got to be, you, know, you got to be connected and, and getting that real-time data so we can make the business and everything much quicker. So this, I get a little bit long-winded on it, but really these are guiding principles to help us keep it simple. You know, if you were to boil this down to what we do, we want to keep it simple. Double-edged sword, we don't have any feature under the sun, but that's okay with us because we help a lot of folks and we have for many years really streamline their business. Okay, so here's the... Uh, this is not me, but my name's Matt, and why am I talking to you? Well, I've been around with the PSA tool for about, going on about seven and a half years now. And just to give you a little bit of background of where I came from and, and why am I even involved here. So I started business by accident with a lot of folks that I talked to in the industry. And I was running cable, low voltage cabling for a guy, and I was collecting his checks, and I was doing the cabling, and I'd even pick up the parts and deliver it to the site and manage the guys. And I was getting my $10 an hour and collecting $15,000, $20,000, sometimes $40,000 checks at the end of the project. And it just wasn't adding up. And I kept trying to think as a young guy, what's the difference between my $10 an hour and his $40,000 check? And guess what? It never made sense to me. So I started my own little low-voltage installation company. And um, I did a really good job. And I was cheaper than anybody else because I'm a young guy. And I started to get traction and build my company. Eventually, I wanted to get bigger, right, and um, merged with another company that did voice and data and tried to conquer the world. Well, over the next six years, we made every mistake in the book, eventually ended up going out of business. I'm here now working with Dell. Um, if that had been different and I had had maybe a different tool set, that maybe not be the case. But Einstein's definition of insanity is exactly what I was, and I was tired of being insane. I kept doing the same mistake over and over and over again and expecting different results. And so I left there and I went to a help enterprise help desk software company. And why do I bring that up? I want a ton about best practices, frameworks. It's a very rigid, the help desk is very rigid and you have to conform. So I learned a ton about that. And at one point in time, uh, one of the vice presidents from that company that left called me and said, hey, would you meet me for beers? 
It happens to be the bars right across the street here in Colorado still. And I met him and he cracks open a little web book and he connects it to his, I don't know what, exactly what he did. And he shows me this little piece of service software now known as Packet Trap PSA. And I was blown away. I said, you know, maybe that would have saved my company back then, but wow, that is enlightening. So now I'm here and I've been here and I've talked to thousands of businesses over the last seven years and I've seen every different type of business and, and lots of times we're a great fit for them. Not always, but lots of times we are. And so I've seen a lot and I've learned a lot and um, hopefully in the stories I share with you today and walking through PSA, you'll get a better idea if this is a good fit for you as well as um, maybe a couple of best practices and not anything else, a little chuckle. All right, so let's go ahead and without further ado, open up Packet Trap. All right, bear with me one second. Here we go. Okay, so a couple of things. I, I logged into Packet Trap. I'm the owner of this fictitious company. Uh, your company would be in the upper right. I do want to address one of the most frequently asked questions about Packet Trap PSA. What type of users do you have and, and how do they interact with the system? So the first part uh, I want to drill into is, is kind of to, to de debunk that and, and walk through the three types of users we have. We have two user types that would be within your system as users. Let's say uh, a technician, let's say a subcontractor. And those users are either standard users or no, no login users. Now, a standard user is anybody that logs in, manipulates data, is scheduled, um, has access to the system. A no login user is exactly that. They don't log into the system. Now, if I had a dime for every time somebody had problems with what a no login user is, I'd be on a beach somewhere. So just to give you an example, let's say you do local service in, let's say, Colorado. And you service a large company, they happen to pick up a satellite office in Fargo, North Dakota, and they say, listen, we'd like to keep our service all under one umbrella. Are you going to be able to do this or do we have to go shopping for another vendor? Of course, you're going to say, yes, we can do it. You then do what most folks would do, go out, look for a friendly competitor in Fargo, North Dakota, who would be willing to support your customer's location for you. You set that person up. You don't necessarily want that person to log into your system. They may only get a ticket a month, maybe a ticket a quarter. So you'd set that person up as a no login user. You could still schedule them, add labor materials, notes on their behalf. And really, anytime a ticket is open from that Fargo, North, North Dakota location, you are in the know, meaning you know exactly what's going on at any time if your client here in Colorado called you and said, what's going on with the network in Fargo? Instead of being clueless, you've been tracking notes, you know who's scheduled, you know when they're scheduled, but that person's not going to log in. They're going to they're fix it. They're going to call you. They're going to tell you what's up. So in, in a very generic basis, that is what a no-login user is. Now, our third type of user is going to be our customer portal user. These are going to be users that you have a trusted relationship with, your customers who are going to actually log in, open tickets, look at the service that you're doing on their behalf. So here you can see a short list of users that I've got in this demo system who I've established a username and a password for. They're going to navigate to my portal open tickets and look at the service I'm doing for them. Now at this point with the way PSA is, is configured, unlimited customer users, you could have one company with a thousand users, or you could have a thousand companies with one or two users. We don't meter those, we don't care, it's included in the product. On the standard users, meaning users that log in and use the tool, those are the metered users, meaning those are the users you're going to talk to your sales rep about. The no login users, again, you can see I have 500 authorized here. They're unlimited. We don't care if you use one or a million of those. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's come up for a little fresh breath of air, and I'll talk you through kind of the tabs. Now, in my time here, we've sold this tool to people who fix furniture in one little city in Texas all the way to companies that are doing global commissioning and decommissioning of MRI machines. So a huge diverse group. And in order to be able to make that pitch to not only the people that fix the furniture, but also the, the people who are gonna use the system in that global company, all the way up to vice presidents and you know, C-level folks, I had to relate this to something that's pretty simple. So everybody's very familiar with spreadsheets and lists. A lot of people come from spreadsheets to lists to Packet Trap PSA. And so they're very familiar with the spreadsheet. We all know what's wrong with the spreadsheet, right? Not everybody can jump in there and edit at once. Not 
they get corrupt, they get wrong, they're just not real time. And so if we relate Packet Trap PSA to a more user-friendly interface to spreadsheets, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. So the tabs across the top here are going to be lists, basically, of different pieces and parts of your service business. Now, depending on your role, and we have multiple roles, you may see all of these tabs or just a subset. And I'll give you a little bit more detail of that in a second. But for example, our service dashboard is really gonna be a list of pertinent information, what's going on with our service department today. So are there any tickets out there that are past due? What have we done today? So we've three tickets are scheduled for today and we have two incoming requests. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. What's coming up? So we have one ticket that's scheduled for tomorrow, no equipment's due, no contracts are due. And then we see all our recent activities. So really just a list of the users and how they've interacted with the system over a certain period of intera interactions. On the right here, we see our tickets by status, right? Our statuses are customizable. So in your organization, you may wanna map those statuses to your call flow. And at a glance, anybody in the service industry space or in your department can look quickly and say, we've got two new tickets we gotta take action on. I've got five out there that are signed and I've got seven out there that are work complete and we wanna get them out to billing. We can quickly track our service billing by month, see how we're doing, right? We had a bad month in February. April's not looking as good as March, but it's picking up. All right, so our customers. Our customer list is exactly that. It's our list of customers. If you imagine that spreadsheet that some folks have or report, right here is just an easy interface to quickly navigate and find the customers that you have within your system. And we can use the quick jump keys, we can do a search, and eventually we arrive at our customer. Our tickets is just a list of tickets in their various conditions and statuses. So right now we're looking at a list of all of our tickets and a status of work complete that are scheduled for any time. Now these can all be toggled so you can get quickly, show me everything out there that's assigned, for example. We get a short list of now all the tickets that are out there and assigned. We could actually say, show me all the tickets that are assigned for today or older. Now I get a quick list of what's out there that's assigned today or older. Our calendar is gonna be a calendar interface to a list of appointments. Now, here I've got this filtered down to just our technicians. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, but you can see our filter is our tech. So I can quickly see what my techs are doing and where they're at. Our equipment list is all the equipment that you service on behalf of your customers. So this could be also folded in with uh, underneath your customer, and I'll show you that. But here, if we wanna quickly find an asset or a piece of equipment for a customer, and they happen to know one of the sensitive pieces of information, like the model number, the serial number, we can quickly just do a quick search. Now again, this is gonna be folded up underneath the customer, so I can go to the customer and see the equipment or assets that that customer owns specifically. But it's also exposed here. Our contracts are gonna be a list of contracts and their various statuses and what customers own that contract, as well as these contracts will fold it up underneath uh, the customer as well. Our billing tab is a list of things that are ready to be billed and things that we've batched out of the system already. Last but not least, we've got our list of reports. We've got canned reports, as well as all these custom reports I've created in my demo. That you can simply just click a link and create a new custom report. Okay, so the takeaway there is each tab folds up certain information. And depending on my role, I may or may not have access to that. And just to expose that a little bit, for example, if I'm a tech, I may not want all my techs to have access to everybody's stuff. I wanna make it simple. So I may just lock it down to showing them their tickets that are assigned to them. So if I log in as a tech, I just see all my tickets that are open, that are assigned to me for any time. and I'm the owner of the company, so obviously I don't have a lot of tickets assigned to me. So that's some of the permissions, and I'll show those to you really quickly. If we go to the settings, we go to users, we've got our roles, any of these roles, they can be renamed. And then within the last three roles, the lead tech, the technician, and the subcontractor, we have these permissions. It's a laundry list of permissions, so I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but you can see we can get really granular. And again, this is in line with our, kind of our goals as, as a team. We wanna keep it simple. We know if we keep it simple in the field, the owners, the managers get the data that they need quickly in real time to better support their customers and hopefully get paid quicker. Okay, so let's talk, it's a good place to talk about, think about the media or the medium that it comes into your business all day, every day. Now, in the help desk world, 
we talked about saving people money. You know, IT is, is sometimes considered a, a black hole of funds, and you know, dating myself, but certainly nine years ago it was. And so you look at some of the folks out there, Forrester Gardner, and they put metrics to things like phone calls and emails. So if we take a look at you know, your support desk and what communications come in, we've got the phone call, and we're never going to get away from the phone call. And some people really like the phone call, not only the customer, but you know, the company. We've got emails, you know, more and more, that's becoming a very acceptable way to communicate. And then we've got, in our case, our portal. So we allow our customers along to the portal open tickets. And if you're one of the uh, customers using the MSP tool from Packet Trap, we've got tickets that are being created be out of alerts that that tool is finding in the network and opening tickets within the PSA. So those are all the different types of medium that we have to manage. Now, going back to that Gartner Forrester, they claim, again, dating myself nine years ago, a telephone call was about $25. So anytime a customer calls you, it's going to cost about $25. Anytime an email sent in, $15. So using those metrics, how do we better support our customer, allow them to feel like we're doing a really good job, and minimize those phone calls coming in? So again, I talked a little bit about the RMM tool. As alerts are triggered within the network, we'll actually create tickets here within PSA. Now, the portal, again, pushing a little of this off to your customer in self-service. I'm just going to go here. Here, I'm a customer of Mass MSP. That's my fictitious business here. And the customer is Pikes Peak BMW. So it's a BMW dealership. So Brian Bones is logged in, and he can see all the tickets that are status open. So what does this do for him? One, he can quickly get in there and just filter down to what's open and say, okay, here are the things that they're working on for me. Do I need to make notes on any of this? You know, is this accurate? In addition, let's say you're working with a retail company, and in the morning I roll in, there's a problem, I open a ticket, maybe the, my cash register is not working. I go home or I go to lunch, the, the, the afternoon manager comes in, logs into the portal, and is attempting to open a ticket about the same problem. So we don't want to dual dispatch, we don't want to send two texts at the same place. So Sally logs in and says, oh, we've, Joe already opened that ticket earlier today, so I don't need to do it. And what's the status? So from here, the customer can drill into these tickets. They can get an idea of the labor, so the effort, the labor materials and expenses that went into this. You know, if you want to expose the billing, and what does it look like to that customer? They can see any attachments. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we move through this. And they can add an attachment, and they can see any public log as well as add a comment. But really what we want to talk about is opening a new ticket. So here, we make it super simple. They log in. Where's the problem? What is the problem? They can put a detailed description in. If there's a piece of equipment that we service for them, they can indicate it here, and they click Save. So again, kind of getting more to better customer ser service and satisfaction, as well as enabling some self-service tools, the portal helps us take those interactions and bring them into the tool. Next is email. Right? Email is increasingly getting difficult to manage. Now, I don't have anything super sexy to show you here, but really, we'll just kind of pretend that we can envision this. We've got an email Dropbox, and that email Dropbox can work in a number of different ways. It could be as simple as tonight you're at dinner, and you get an email from your VIP customer that says, hey, Bob, will you take a look at this for me in the morning? Well, instead of trying to manage that within your inbox, you can just simply forward it to the Dropbox, and a ticket will be there waiting for you in the morning. Two, I've seen folks just forward their support inbox right to Packet Trap. So as I request help in an email, it pops into Packet Trap, opens a ticket. The third example might be if you want to get really elaborate with a, a request form or a, a ticket submission form on your website, you can do that. And then when they hit submit, it just wraps it up in an email, sends it to the email Dropbox, and the ticket will be created. Okay, so we talked about the portal. We talked about the, uh, the uh, MSP tool. And we talked about email. So what's left is the phone call, right? So in my business, I hired a gal. Um, Real interesting, I hired a gal that just got a, a master's in business from Denver University, one of the better schools around here. Brought her in, she had just had a baby, and I thought she would help me manage and grow my business. So we brought her in, and after about a week of yellow stickies and notes all over the place, I finally called her, I said, okay, we gotta do lunch. So we, we go out to lunch, and I said, Lisa, her name was Lisa, I said, help me understand this. You're 10 times more educated than me. You're more ambitious, you have more energy. Why am I just, 
coming back to my office and seeing all these yellow stickies. And she made a really good point. She said, you know, you're terrified if I log into your accounting system, I'm going to find something, find some dirt, apparently, or you're afraid I'm going to steal from you. So you haven't given me access to that. So I have no customer information. Um, there's a file cabinet in the back that weighs like 7,000 pounds. It's fireproof and it's dirty in that warehouse. I certainly don't want to go back there and dig through files to help the customer. You've given me no tools to help the customer. And so I learned a really, really valuable lesson there. And that is one of the great things that the PSA tool brings us is a buffer between our accounting system, our file cabinet, and it brings information to people's fingertips that's really not overly sensitive. And if we can enable our users, our employees, to better help customers, instead of coming back to your office and pulling the yellow stickies off your monitor at 3 o'clock of the day when you're exhausted and making customer phone calls, maybe those calls had been addressed prior. So just a quick example, if I was Lisa and a phone call came in, and we'll just continue to talk through with the, the BMW dealership, I can quickly just roll through here and find the dealership. I could have used our quick jump keys, go to Pike Speak BMW, or I could have done a search. But again, the phone rings, Lisa picks it up, thanks for calling Mass MSP, how can I help you? This is Brian, I've got some questions. She's clicked into the customer profile, and here we can see some supporting tabs, but we've landed on the overview tab. And the goal of the overview tab is to show us the most recent and pertinent information for this customer. So instead of Lisa you know, being prepared with, you know, armed with a pen and paper, Lisa now has some intelligence to say, well, Brian, how can I help you? In this case, if he's calling on a job that we did for him in the past, we've got him right here. She can drill into it and answer hopefully any questions he might have. We can see any comments for the customer. We can see that this customer has two contracts, two blocks of hours contracts. Any notes on the customer? We have some additional information like who's the tech that we'd like to send out there? Who's the account manager? Maybe I need to call Matt and say, hey, Brian's on the phone and has some questions about maybe a job we did or, or something you've been working on. Kind of see how we, how we bill them here and then we see how we notify the customer. So we have global notifications, but also, we also have singular, singular notifications per customer. So if you want to fine tune them, let's say Brian's like, I'm sick of getting email from you. I know you're doing a good job, leave me alone. You can come in here and select how to notify Brian. Now, again, we've got some other supporting tabs. We track multiple contacts, multiple locations. We can see Pikes Peak BMW's got three locations. Here's where we track the comments. Here's all the equipment. I told you we fold equipment up underneath the customer. Here's how we do that. We've got any contracts, any attachments, you know, supporting information that helps, could help Lisa or could help Ted, the tech here, help the customer. Maybe it's a Visio diagram of their, their network or where people sit. We see the, the entire history for the customer. We can quickly search and sort if the ticket in question happened a while ago. And last but not least, we have customer-centric reports, right? In my world, I got a phone call from somebody who actually owned a car dealership because every time I look out my window, I see your van here. I feel like I'm just financing a Hawaiian vacation home for you. Why don't you come in here, bring everything that you've done over the last nine months, and we're going to go through them one by one. And what that told me was I was about to lose money because he was going to nitpick on each one of those jobs. Here, I could have quickly you know, run a quick report and say, hey, Brian, if you have any questions, let's address them now. Or better yet, log into your portal and see what we've done, and then pull the ones out that you have question on, and we'll address them there. My world, I had to run ask the person who did our QuickBooks to please run me a report of all this. It took about three, four days, and I take four or five hours out of the field trying to justify getting paid. So our customer-centric reports really help us, again, be armed with information. However, if Brian's just calling to open a ticket, we just navigate over to the actions and populate a new ticket. So in this case, we'll say need help, or you say help with uh, Dell laptop. Like, that'll be easy. So in this case, Brian's calling and says, I need help, my laptop, I spilled water on it today, I, I need help. So we've got the customer, and we can pick the location. Brian, do you want us to go to the showroom? Yep, that's where I'll be. And do you want us to be, are you the primary contact? Yes, no. If no, we can change that as well. So over on the side here, we've got our type. Really, it's like a category. Now, these are all customizable as well as the priority. So if this is critical, we can indicate that. Now, these are what we call optional built-in fields. You can remove these from the form, or you can have them included. Down below is our detailed description. Now, if we need to give the tech more information on what happened here, Brian was put his feet up on the desk and knocked the water over, and now the, it's smoking, right? Whatever details would help the tech better be prepared to deal with Brian. Here's all of the assets that this customer owns. Again, if it was a piece of equipment that we had listed, we could select it. In this case, we don't have it, so we could populate new here. 
The referral code, this is just a custom field. We can add custom fields to a customer record. We can add custom fields to a ticket, uh, as well as a piece of equipment. So here I'm just going to indicate it was an existing customer. And again, this is an example of a, a custom field I had for a demo that we did a little bit ago. If we decide how we build this, this customer, by default, we're going to send it to their, the showroom, and we're fine with that, so we're not going to touch it. And this does not go against the contract. If it did go against the contract, we could select, hey, we're going to pull this out of a block of hours. But just for the example, we're going to keep it as billable. So the next step is we understand now what the problem is, and Brian says, hey, I really need to know when you're coming. So I might go out and now say, save it and assign it. And what I want to do is find somebody that's available. Now, by default, Ted is the tech that we like to send there. So he's going to jump in here as the default tech. So if he says, yeah, I don't care when you get here, just send Ted. I can look out and say, okay, well, we've got an availability. It looks like you know, afternoon today. Now, in this case, you know, Brian's done the water. He doesn't have a laptop. So I may want to quickly, oops, wrong button, find an available user. So here I'm browsing specifically just our text. I've got this filtered down to our text. I'm going to pop open the options, and here are our groups, right? Do I want to look at management, text, or maybe anybody, right? If this is a big enough deal, maybe I want to send the owner to go help Brian, and therefore I would open it up to nobody. But in this case, we just want to look at text. It's a pretty big deal, so I might want to filter it just to today and look at, and we're sitting here at 2.30, mountain time. I just want to look at between the hours of 3 or 5 today, who's available. I filter it, and I can see I have two technicians that are available to roll out and help Brian. So I'm just going to say, Brian, I can get Ted there by 3. Will that work? He says, yes. He's already on the list. Great. We have an appointment 3 to 6. Click Save. And it's done. Okay. Now, a lot of things happen behind the scenes there. And what first thing that happened is we would have emailed Brian and said, Brian, we created a ticket for you. Here's your ticket number for your reference. So immediately, we're letting the customer be in the know, right? So he knows we're taking care of him. Then we sent him an email that we signed Ted for 3 o'clock today. Now, this is if you want to notify them that way. We also could have sent Ted an email saying, hey, you've been assigned a new call today. Be prepared to go out to Pikes Peak to BMW and deal with the uh, laptop with water all over it. We also change the status from open to assigned. We have a built-in workflow. This is any time you had an assignment, go ahead and just we'll assume that it's assigned and you can move on. And in Lisa's case, the, here, once she opens the ticket, she can move it to assign, meaning, hey, until we hear from the field or we hear from the, the tech, we're done with it. I can go help other customers. I can do whatever we need to do. So she's done. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a quick breath of fresh air again, and I'm going to pop open our mobile edition. Okay, I'm just going to pull it over the top here. So here's the mobile edition. Now, every user gets access to the regular edition, so they can log in as a user, or, and they get access to the mobile edition. You know, in my world, my guys used to take wagons into the, the building with you know, a thermos of coffee and a, a lunch pail and their stands, and they get very comfortable in the telecom room and, uh, and plug in. Now, let's say after I collapsed all my stuff, put it in my wagon, was heading out, and the CFO goes, hey, wait a second, can you help me with my iPad, my iPhone, and my exchange? Well, in my world, the tech would absolutely help that person, but he would probably leave and never record what we did. And so in the example of the mobile edition, instead of unfolding the laptop and so on and so forth, with an iPhone, an iPad, an Android, whatever you want it to be, they pop in and open that call. Now, maybe we don't charge for it, but we at least know that we did some goodwill there and went on track it. Okay, so I'm Ted Tech, right? I've logged in as Ted. I can see my schedule from 8 to 11. Actually, if I go to my dashboard, I should be able to see my appointment this afternoon. Perfect. So I can see the two appointments for today. I can see that I'm going out to help Pikes Peak BMW with the laptop that we spilled water on. Now, if I just went out and did labor, I can click here to complete my assignment. So the goal here is we are assigning things to text. It could be an assignment for one tech, multiple texts. It could be multiple assignments on a single ticket. It's really pretty dynamic. But if I just finished my assignment, this piece of work, I can click here and add my labor and any comments. Now, in this case, let's say it took a little bit more. So we're going to actually drill into the appointment. And here we can see the ticket. I can see it's assigned. I can see here's my assignment. I want my tech to click this box and indicate what he did. Down below, we see the customer information. So I can see where I'm going. I can get a map. If I have GPS enabled in my device, I should be able to get directions to that location if I, have, if I haven't been there before. I can see my contact. If I'm on my Android or my iPhone, I can click the call. I can click the email. I see other information about the ticket that'll help me get my job done. Now, 
In this case, we went out and we, we actually added some material. So I'm just going to say we sold them a new workstation. I can put any comments here. Now, if you're using an accounting system, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes, but if I'm using like QuickBooks, QuickBooks Online, some of those tools, any comments here that I put public are going to go over to my invoice, okay? I'm going to save you the, the pain of watching me try to spell and type. We'll just pretend I put some words in there. So I'm going to add this workstation. I'm going to save it. And let's say we're going to add an expense. In this case, we drove 14 miles. Again, I can add my public comments. These will be exposed on the invoice if they're public. I'll click Save. And now what we want to do is complete my assignment. So I'm going to pop in here, complete my assignment. I'm going to add some labor. Defaults to the day and the duration of the appointment. So if Ted was there for a little bit longer than expected, maybe it was three hours and 30 minutes. And now, if I was a very good and fast typer, I would say, went out, saw that Brian's computer was a complete loss, gave him a new workstation, got him up and running, did a little bit of training, three hours, 30 minutes, we're good to go. And that, again, is going to port over to the invoice. Now, for the sake of time, I don't want to talk too much about this, but at one point in time, Bob Walters, guy from Cardinal Health, um, had a conversation about impeccable invoices. And a lot of my customers would slow pay or they would challenge me on every invoice I sent them. And what I realized is we were so reactive. My guys would go out and do 50 jobs. and I wouldn't see them for a week. And then they'd come in. I'm like, what did you do on Monday? Oh, wait, last Monday. Well, they completely forget. And so by the time we found out what they did, because we were unorganized, it ended up being maybe you know, six hours of work, $3,000 for a one-line fixed T1. And nine times out of ten, I'm going to call, get a call about that as the business owner. I'm going to have to go sit down with my customer and justify why I should get paid. But going back to what Bob Walters said from Cardinal Health, he only pays impeccable invoices. And what we want is our tech to, and I kind of coined this, frame, this phrase, enter their time on the customer dime. It's part of the project. We want as much detail while it's fresh in their mind here in our labor entry under the comments that we can get, either for our own purposes or for both ours and our customer. So Ted's going to add his labor. He's going to click Save. He gets a little bit of positive reinforcement. You completed your assignment. Here we see it, and now he can go home. But maybe before we leave, we want to show this to a customer. So they may print this to the screen. I'm just going to use one of the forms here and say, Brian, this is what we did today. Uh, I drove 14 miles. I worked for an hour. All right, I sold you a business entry level workstation or laptop, whatever, and I worked for 3.5 hours. And he's going to probably say, Thanks for saving my life. And now we can move on. Or we could say, Brian, do you mind giving me your John Hancock? And I like to call this the CYA. Cover your tail, right? So now if the customer rolls back and says, whoa, $3,500, $4,000, come on, it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, down below we have a date, a time, and a John Hancock from Brian that you signed off on it, Brian. So now I've got a leg to stand on. Now I can email that to the customer for his reference, or I can just simply say I'm done and let the office take care of it. I flip back to my dashboard, and I can go to the next job. Now, one thing to, to mention before we move away from the mobile edition, here we've got a little tool here that says, hey, show me the tech, all the incomplete open jobs for today are older. So what does this tell me? I've got two jobs up here. I've completed one. One is incomplete, but I've got two that are incomplete. That means that there's something from my past kind of haunting me to be finished, right? And here's the job right here. And if I drill into it, I would hope that my tech could complete that. And what we want to see is the techs have pretty much an empty bucket, right? We want to be able to go home and say, okay, I have zero things that are assigned to me that are incomplete that are open for day or older. All right. I'm talking too much. I apologize. So let's uh, quickly jump in and enter this as an owner, let's say. So we, we, we entered as Lisa, the dispatcher. She took some information. She opened a ticket. She got it dispatched out to Ted. Ted rushed out there, fixed the computer, did what he had to do. And uh, now it's my turn, right? I want to get paid. I want to get paid faster. In my world, it was not very uncommon for me to get paid 120 plus days, right? I wasn't savvy enough in business to realize that that was bad. But the problem stemmed from going out, providing service, not getting any input or feedback from the field. By the time I got the input and the feedback from the field, it was two weeks after the service was done. The invoice was not impeccable. It was very lacked. It lacked a lot of detail. I'd send that to my customer snail mail. It's now, let's say, 17 days past. They got that 30 terms, and now they're going to call me and complain. So here, as an owner, at the end of the day, 
I can come in, go to my dashboard and say, hmm, I got eight jobs out there that are in status of work complete. Let's go take a look at them. This may not be the owner. It could be your bookkeeper, whatever the case. So here, what I need to do is get these along the way. So here we can see this ticket. It's for Ted. I'm going to pull it up. And now I'm sitting at the overview of the ticket, very similar to the overview of the customer, right? Most pertinent and recent information on this ticket. The last few log entries, the last labor material and expense items. Now, I may want to look at these as, as little buckets, right? So what items did we push out there? Did we get any description of why we're going to charge our customer on this labor three and a, three and a half hours? Maybe I want to edit this and add some, some substance to the actual labor entry so it's very clear and we're going to get paid quicker. I may want to look at my billing. So what's this look like? Okay, the ticket's billable. Here's the labor materials and expenses that were put into it. The customer owes me $5,300 and change. And now I can see my profitability. Again, keeping track on a ticket-by-ticket -ticket basis, are we making money? Now, I don't know if these numbers are accurate just because of the demo, but I would say 81% margin is pretty darn good. I can see any attachments. So any attachments I might have uploaded or Lisa might have uploaded for the tech supporting information, any attachments that we might have uploaded from the customer, as well as we've got that CYA again, our signed entry form. I want to make sure that this is signed and it's signed by the guy that requested the work. Okay, looks good. And I can see the log. Now, I will mention on another, I'll go to another ticket to mention this, but I will come back to this in a second about the end-to-end -end email collaboration tool that we've got here. But if this all looks good, I see Ted's completed assignment. I'm going to change the status. Status changes to closed, and I save the ticket. All right, now once that's done, what happens? You know, any of those statuses are customizable except for new and closed. We got to have something when a new email comes in, so we call it new. You can change any status other than the new and closed in between the two. And closed says, hey, when the ticket's closed, throw it over to this billing tab. Now here you can see we've got a host of tickets that are ready to be billed. And again, we see our billing batches. Now, if we want to create a new batch, we just simply create new batch. We've got our batch options. Where are you going to take this? QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks, or maybe another accounting system that takes uh, simple XML as an import. Batch options look good. I'm just going to select this ticket for my batch. I'll save the batch. And now I've got a batch. Next, I just, in QuickBooks Online, I can just click transfer the billing system. and I haven't worked on this demo in a while, but hey, it worked. And now I can see that I sent over an invoice to QuickBooks Online. And I have the invoice number, and if there's any question, I can refer back to the ticket. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, so I do want to talk real quickly through the end-to-end -end email tool here. So one thing I want to show you is this is a Gmail for TED Tech, okay? So if we go to his inbox, we can see all the alerts that he's been getting. And we see that he's assigned ticket 1340. Okay, so if we go back into, see if we can find 1340 pretty quick here. So let's see if I can do a quick search for 1340. Let's go ahead and open this up. All right, so there's 1340. So going to the log, so anytime an alert gets sent to a customer or a tech or anybody internally, they have the ability to respond to that email through their inbox. So here what happens, we create an assignment for Ted, and this was to help Brian over the, at the dealership with some low resources on his PC. And here we can see a private note, which is a response from email from our tech, Ted, says, hey, thanks, I'll see what I can do. This is the third time I've gone out there. Brian downloads all kinds of stuff, and he's going to continue to run into problems. So this, again, keeping everybody within the business in the know of what's going on. Now, again, customers can respond. Internal users can respond. If, if it's a user or like a technician, for example, we're not going to send that out to the customer. But if the customer responds, we're going to send that out to everybody that's assigned and related to this ticket. Okay. Um, last but not least, just a couple of the reports. Again, uh, you can create a custom report. This wizard, just basically name it. Choose your data set, for example, tickets, and who has access to it. I'm going to save and continue. I now just can drag and drop what data I want. I can delete it pretty quickly by clicking on a little red X here, take it to the next step. I now decide how do I want to see profit? How do I want to see my time open and my totals? So I want to sum it all. Go next. Now we get into filters, like how do we want to 
needs to be filtered out, date range of, let's say, this year, assigned to anybody, status equals any. Now I can create my own custom filters down here. I can't go into that because of time, but very powerful. I go to the next step, and it says, how do you want to group it, and how do you want to sort it? I save it, run it, now here's my custom report. I can export that to Excel, or I could use any of the canned reports that we have. For example, I can track real time. This is something I couldn't do in my business, and this is, you know, I had lots of problems. One of them, I was losing billable hours. And here, I could quickly jump in and say, I just want to look at my techs. How are they tracking for the week, right? It's an important metric. Well, Sean, I got a problem, pal. Uh, your last labor entry was, was Wednesday. You entered four hours. I got nothing from you on Tuesday. You know, did you, did you get sick? Did you decide to just go home and go to bed for the day? Well, what happened, right? So I can look at this day by day, individual by individual, and make sure that we're getting as close to eight hours a day or even more um, so that we know we're tracking those billable hours the users are actually using the system. Okay, so good place for me to stop. I'm going to see if I've got any questions out there. One second. Okay, it looks like somebody lost audio. Hopefully it's okay. So I do have a question. Um, first question, how do you set up the invoices to be batched into QuickBooks? All right. So the question is really like, what do I do? Do I invoice out of Packet Trap or do I invoice out of QuickBooks? Well, it's either really. You know, I could come in and let's go ahead and find a ticket that is closed. Here's the one we've been playing with. I can come in and click Print. And for example, a billing summary. This billing summary is very much like an invoice. And here we can send to the customer by email, or we can print it and send it snail mail, you know, what we did out on site. So this could be your invoice. A lot of folks that are comfortable using QuickBooks or their accounting system where they just invoice out of that, they certainly can batch them. I sent that one over to QuickBooks online. I will show you in QuickBooks what happens. All right, so I'm going to go to Customers Create Invoices. Here's an example of an invoice that was sent over from Packet Trap. Basically, what we do is we say, QuickBooks, I need an invoice number. So we get that invoice number. And then in the batch, we say, this is the date we want it to be billable, right, or the, the invoice date. If I'm doing work on the 1st for something that was finished out late on the, on the 30th, I may want to batch that out on the 30th instead of the 1st. So we get to dictate that. We then say, hey, QuickBooks, I've got a customer, Allstate Insurance. Do you happen to have that customer? If yes, great. Create an invoice with that invoice number you gave me with this date and uh, for this customer. If no, we're going to go ahead and create the customer within QuickBooks for you. We send over the ship to. We'll send over the PO number if applicable. And now we get into the body of the invoice. The first line of the invoice is going to give us the ticket number as well as the short description and a PO number, if again, if applicable. And then we're going to plop in the date the item was added into Packet Trap, the item description, the item, I'm sorry, the item name, the quantity, the item description, and then what I like to say is, you know, the meat within the nut, right? What happened out on site? Day one, this is what I did. Drove one mile. These are the tech notes, right? This is that, that again, the meat within the nut that proves that we did work and, and it's, it's fresh and it's relative. Uh, we see some mileage and we see some parts. And then down here, we see some more labor. So we're going to send all that over. We're going to total it up, tax it, make memo to the ticket that created this invoice, and it can be flagged to be printed or emailed. If it's flagged to be printed, we just go print, batch. This little window is going to pop up, and here are all the invoices that I just need to, boom, print to the printer. Or I can hit print email invoices. Hopefully that doesn't blow up on us. But uh, we should then email that batch. I think I clicked the wrong button there. All right. I hope that answers some questions there. Yeah, I didn't want to do that. Bye-bye. Okay. So there's a question, again, as far as the mobile and the regular user. Everybody that's a, a standard user, going back to our original Q and A in the beginning, um, or a description of the users. Every user gets a mobile login as well as a standard login. So I've got a question. Let's see. 
One sec, guys, trying to read this very small chat. So the question is about kind of geo plotting. Like, can you see all the tickets within a certain zip code? Or now we do have integration with Google Maps. Now where you're going to see that is you know, in the customer. Again, I showed you on the mobile device how we can get access to the map. I can get a map here anytime I click. And when we look for, we go to a sign and we look for an available person. We can actually get our proximity. How far is this technician from a static address to this customer? Now, if you're just doing local service and they all report to one office, not a lot of value. If you're doing service in a large area, maybe multiple states, and you have one dispatcher and she wants to dispatch the technicians that are closest to that customer, absolutely there's value there. As far as seeing tickets on a you know, by a zip code or a zone is what we'd like to call it, basis, we can come into our ticket list, we can customize the list, and I want to see our zip and our zone. Now, this is a user setting, so you can do this on the customer list as well as the tickets list. But now I can do things like, hey, show me, here's our zip code, and here's a zone. Now, the zone I haven't populated throughout here, but this is just user definable. What's the zone this customer's in? Downtown, uptown, south of town, right? Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, whatever you want to do there is up to you. But I can quickly come in here and say, hey, show me, say a call comes in and says, I need you to help me and this is the zip code I'm in, right? Or the area I'm in. I can say, hey, show me all my open tickets, scheduled for any time, and show me tickets only in the west zone. Hopefully I can find this here. There you go. All right, so this is going to give us a short list, and we can see our assignment dates here. So I could tell this customer, I say, you know what, I've got Sean um, rolling out to that zone west on the 24th as well as the 25th, right? And I can make a quick determination that says, you know, Ted is going to be there from 8 to 11 in that zone. And so maybe what I do is create a ticket for that customer based on where Ted's there. So we can see zip and zone not only from our ticket list, and we can group them pretty quickly, and we can go to our calendar and say, okay, I'm going to do a quick virtual find. And I can say, show me the zip or the zone of whatever. So here we can expose it. Boom, boom. And now we can do a quick find and find that zip or that zone. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, here's a good question from Alex. Alex asks, is this based on Outlook or is it internal within Packet Trap PSA? And he's referring to the calendar. The calendar is actually internal to Packet Trap. Now, with some exceptions, meaning integration with those other tools can be done in one of two ways. If I go to my personal settings, I have a couple different options. Calendar Sync. So if you're using Outlook or Google Calendar or something like that, I can subscribe to a external calendar. And so as I add appointments within Packet Trap PSA, they can be pushed out to those other calendar applications. So as I log into my Outlook, I'll see all the appointments that are within Packet Trap PSA. So if I'm gonna have lunch with mom, but I see I'm completely booked, maybe it's not a good idea to have lunch with mom today. The other option is on the notifications. These are how we receive emails and texts on things that are going on within our service business. But down below here, we can send cal calendar meeting requests by email. So if you book an appointment for me today or tomorrow, I'm going to get a meeting request in my inbox that says, hey, you've been invited to it in a, a meeting. You know, do you want to accept it? I accept it. It moves into my calendar. Now, you can tentatively accept everything. Um, and so, again, we can push that into uh, some other calendars. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, move to the next slide, guys. Answer a bunch of questions here. And the next slide kind of gives us the next action step. You know, so what, what do you do from here? You know, one, if you haven't signed up for a trial, you go out, get the free trial, see if it fits. You know, it's not always the best fit or match, but for a lot of folks it is. Um, as soon as you sign up for a trial or send in questions, you're going to get directed to a territory manager. A territory manager will make sure you're taken care of. If you don't have a territory manager signed to your account yet, you haven't signed up for a trial, sales at packettrap.com, uh, and they'll definitely make sure you get the help that you need. So I'm sorry I couldn't address all the questions today, guys. Um, Time's a little bit limited, and this is 
kind of put in between two different appointments, but I appreciate you being uh, engaged and involved. I hope that you learned something. I hope I didn't bore you to death. And again, questions, concerns, shoot them off to sales at packettrap.com. They'll be able to get you help. Thanks very much.